today, today I'm going to show you guys how to use layer masks and I promise no helmets required. If you follow my work, you know that it's my favorite thing. I use it all the time, especially when I'm coloring. I even use it for my inking. It's a very non-destructive way to color because it allows me to change the color palette like that. And I'm sorry it's taking me so long to get around to showing you guys how to use this. Before we get started and I show you this super secret technique, I mean, it's not so secret, so I'm about to show it to you. If you find this video useful by the end of it, please like and subscribe. Anyways, let's jump right in. Hold on. First, maybe I should explain what a layer mask is. It's an extension added to an existing layer which allows you to edit the image without making any physical change to the original layer itself. You can find it at the bottom of the layers tab. Click on the little square thing with a circle in the middle. Now that the layer mask has been applied, you're good to go. This works using a range of values between black and white. Black conceals the image, while white reveals the image beneath the layer mask. At your disposal are all of the brushes available in Photoshop. Using black, I can begin to cut away at the image using different kinds of techniques, from soft edges to cross hatching or even a gradient tool. At the end of it, if you hold shift and click on the layer mask, you can turn it on and off. You can see that it preserves the integrity of the image beneath. Now to see how this is applied, let's go back to Batman and his super friends. Once I finish the initial inks, I'll apply a layer mask and chip away at the solid blacks, adding in finer details to his cowl. Looking at this in terms of traditional inking, this is similar to how I use white gouache with a brush or a whiteout pen. I could use an eraser or even draw around the negative space, but both are either destructive or very time consuming. Here I start using my favorite brush, which is a simple soft round brush set to dissolve, and begin to define some of the highlights around Batman. It's the perfect way to add an extra sheen to your figures along with a little bit of extra detail. This technique works fantastic for leather. Now for colors, the same basic premise of how I use the layer mask applies. Try to keep up as this might get confusing, but I'll do my best to explain this properly. Let's take a look at the figure right here. Line work on top, color flats underneath. The first thing I do is create a new group. Let's call that foreground. I then go to the layer with my color flats and select that. Keeping the selection active, I go to the group folder and then click on the layer mask icon at the bottom. As you can see, it created a mask on the entire group. Anything drawn or painted within this group is confined to the area that is white, which is based on the selection of my color flats. Next, I create three layers within the group. First layer is set to normal, this will be my base color. Second is set to multiply for my shadows, and above that is my highlight layer, which is usually set to screen. I then apply a mask to all three layers. Clicking on each one, I hit Ctrl I in order to invert it all to black and conceal the colors. I then duplicate the entire group and rename it background. These group of colors will now only affect the background, as you can see here when I turn off this mask. Now let's get back to the fun stuff and render away. Once again, you can use any of the brushes you have available to create your shadows. I usually have the shadow layer at a lower opacity, like around 30 to 50%. You can then go to the highlight layer and do the same thing, adding some of the brighter spots on the character. How I prefer to color is from dark to light. Typically, I'll go to my base layer and completely reveal that. I then go to my highlight layer and start sculpting out my extreme highlights. After establishing the light, I then go to the shadow layer and begin to render in the darker areas. Once I think I'm set on the rendering, I'll mask out the base color once again, but usually I'll grab the gradient tool and add a bit of secondary lighting. Again, why do I color this way? Well, let me show you how malleable this is. If any of these colors don't work for me, I can simply go to the actual layer and change the colors. When I turn the layer mask on and off, you can see how it's actually applied to the entire image, but you can only see what's constrained within the mask. Let's say I want the highlights green. Simple enough. I just click it and fill it. 
I don't have to worry about using a color slider or a use slider to change the color. I can directly pick from my swatches the exact color that I want. When I go to the background group, I can then add gradients or crosshatching and it won't affect the image on top as it's all constrained within their own little group. Now let's go back to this crazy double page spread. Once I get the color flats from Becca Kinsey, I follow the same basic steps I used to set up my layer structure. This is a fairly established workflow that I have, so I've asked Becca to keep the color flats of my figures on a separate layer as the background. This allows me to use the magic wand tool easily to select and isolate my foreground from the background. Using standard complementary colors, I chose to keep the foreground cool using blues and the background warm using orange. This really helps me visualize and exaggerate the separation of the foreground and the background. This piece did have a third group which consists of the Justice League. I'll label that mid-ground. From there, I'll go back to my foreground group and begin to paint in my highlights. Typically, I'll just use the standard pencil tool as it's always 100% opacity. I'll then use a soft round brush to smooth out the edges. At some point during the process, I found the reds and yellows peeking through distracting. So I created a layer with 100% opacity and set it to normal. This allows me to look at only two values, blue or orange. I'll then work in my shadows. If you've seen my other videos, you'll be very familiar with this technique. This is more of a preference as it makes the entire image less intimidating for me to work on. It allows me to hyper-focus on just the highlights and the shadows. Once I've finished all my rendering, I'll turn off that blue layer and see how it reacts to the color flats beneath. Usually, I'll have to tweak some of the shadow layers, adding in a couple little gradients here and there, a little bit from my base color as they sometimes react differently once you see them on top of the actual colors. At the top of my layer structure, I'll add a new group. Usually, I'll call that like SFX or something like that. Within this group, I'll add in a crap ton of lights, from glows to streaks. And in the end, I swapped the warm colors for something cooler. That final step was made easy for me because all of the rendering was done on a layer mask. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys next time. I think I need to start getting out of the house more.